And we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Emily Breeze, um, who's going to be talking about developing an online cognitive assessment battery. Emily, are you sound good? Yeah, yeah okay. I'm here. Brilliant. Thanks, Take Jay. Take away. So, yeah, my name is Emily, and I'm a final year PhD student at the Open University in Milton Keynes. And I've been using Gorilla since about 2017, primarily for my PhD project, assessing uh, cognitive impact of circadian rhythm. But I've also used it in a few other cognitive projects, including a facial recognition task. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking to you about the benefits of piloting your studies and my experiences of piloting uh, with Gorilla, including the additional challenges associated with working with online remote participants and how I've modified my approach to address these. So first of all, just a quick definition of what piloting actually is. So piloting is a small study to test research protocols, data collection instruments, sample recruitment strategies, and other research techniques in preparation for a larger study. And there are two ways in which you can pilot. So first of all, you can either pilot with a small sample of your intended participant group. So this is great because the results you see here are likely to be closer to those that you see in your final study. However, if you have quite a small sample group uh, that you're intending to test later on, and so you need to use your participants that you use in a pilot later on as well, you need to be really careful about practice effects uh, with cognitive tasks. The other way that you can pilot is with your colleagues, friends and family. So this is a great way to easily obtain feedback because you can just go and ask them to do your study and then tell you any issues and what they thought of it. Um, it also allows you to test a bit of a range of people. So there'll be people that have task experience, uh, know your field, potentially know cognitive testing uh, with your colleagues. But then also there'll be those that are less familiar, perhaps with science in general, um, in your friends and family. And these people are probably more similar to the general population. However, they are unlikely to represent your intended population, unless, of course, your intended population is the general public. Now, one key benefit of piloting that I have found is that if you're using a platform such as Prolific for your recruitment, where you have to state how long your study is going to take participants, piloting allows you to make a really accurate estimation of this length of time. And it can be really tempting to admit piloting, especially if you've planned your study really, really well. But no matter how much planning you have done, there are likely to be unforeseen issues so this makes investment in piloting absolutely essential now it's also really important to do both types of piloting which i found out the hard way at the beginning of my phd so one of the tasks i use is a trail making task so this is effectively a computerized dot to dot so participants have to complete the numbers in ascending order in part A and then numbers and letters in part B. So 1A, 2B, as you can see from the instructions here. Now this seemed simple enough and I piloted it with friends and family and it went completely fine. There were no issues, no one completed it wrong. It was great. So I went straight on and collected my sample through Prolific. Uh, in my case, this was looking at shift workers. And I found over six different ways in which participants incorrectly completed this task. Now, there were basic, perhaps predictable errors, such as completing TMTB the wrong way round, so A1, B2, uh, as well as some more unusual ones with completing all of the net letters and then all of the numbers. I even had one participant who obviously decided the task wasn't hard enough already and completed it completely backwards, starting at M and ending with 1. Now, interestingly, they actually completed this completely correctly, um, but I had to exclude them anyway. And what I realised was that by only piloting in person, my pilot subjects had had the opportunity to ask the questions beforehand that my online participants just didn't get. And so using my findings from my online data collection for the next round of testing, I introduced some clearer instructions as well as a demonstration video. And this improved my results dramatically. Now, when piloting your study, it's often tempting to only pilot the cognitive tasks that you're using, as this is often the most complicated part of your study. Um, so doing this is checking things like it's functioning correctly, making sure that all your stimuli are presenting in the correct position and for the correct amount of time, uh, making sure that all your images are showing with a clear resolution, 
and that your instructions, unlike my trail making instructions, are very clear. And if you're using any randomizers, making sure that they are working correctly. However, it's also really, really important to check other parts of your study. So a misinterpretation of a questionnaire can be just as detrimental as a failed cognitive task. And things to look out for with questionnaires are things like spelling errors, making sure that all of the response boxes are working in the way you want them to, making sure that if participants can skip a question because it's not relevant to them, or if you want to force them to answer all of the questions, making sure that is in place. And also, as mentioned a couple of times today, making sure that any attentional checks are working. It's also really important to check your consent and information sheets to make sure that these are really understandable and that you're not using any scientific jargon that maybe you use in everyday life, but your participants don't. Another thing is to make sure that your consent is being recorded correctly. So this is really vital as if it hasn't recorded consent correctly or the participants were somehow able to skip this page, you then don't have informed consent and you have to remove all of their data. And then finally, a thing to make sure to pilot as well is your data outputs. So this is making sure that the spreadsheets that Gorilla has produced for you actually give you the information that you need to calculate your outcome variables. So for example, if you're doing a uh, reaction time task and you want to make sure you catch any errors, for example, if they're pressing during the fixation point, this might suggest that their responding inhibition is failing. Um, also making sure that it connects any metadata you need, so make sure time, device, uh, that your anonymization is working the way you intend it to, and if you're using something like Prolific, making sure that it is generating that completion code and feeding them back to the correct site. Now with all the piloting in the world, there is inevitably going to be at least one participant who completes your study in a completely unexpected way particularly with complex cognitive testing. And this is where exclusion criteria come in handy and piloting can be really helpful in creating these. Now, I know these have been mentioned a few times already today, but exclusion criteria are conditions which, if met, lead to the removal of a person's data. And typically, these include things like if they haven't given consent, if they're under age, or if they haven't completed your questionnaire properly. But there are also cognitive testing exclusion criteria. So for example, if a participant isn't responding to over 50% of the trials, it suggests, especially with online testing, that they've walked off, got a cup of tea and just left your study running. And piloting your studies can really help identify these issues, but also other further criteria that you might not have thought of. So for example, is a person just pressing the space bar continuously to try and get through your trial as quick as possible? Or like in the case of my trial making task, is a person not understanding the correct the instructions and is completing it completely the wrong way around? So based off my own personal experiences, this is the pipeline that I currently use when I create a new experiment. So to begin with, obviously I create my experiment in Gorilla. I then personally test the whole thing. So I make sure that all of the tasks are working correctly. I make sure that the data output is producing what I'm expecting it to produce. I make sure that all of the spelling errors are got rid of and uh, that any, all of the images are showing clearly. I also make purposeful errors in specific points so that I can then see where these are coming up in the data set and then check that that data set is appropriate. I then send this on to my supervisors. So these are experts in the field. They have experience with cognitive testing and they do a similar thing. They check that everything is working, that my questionnaires are appropriate and that all of the stimuli are presenting correctly. They also make specific errors and make sure that I can see, catch where they've made these errors and calculate their scores properly. After this, I send this out to colleagues, friends and family. So with my friends and family, this is predominantly people outside of science. Um, and they do the study as if they are the participants. So they start the whole way through checking that everything is working correctly. 
This is also a great time to check that my study works across platforms. So if you are intending to let people do it on a computer and a tablet and a phone, you need to make sure that it works across devices as well as checking that it works across different online platforms. Um, and this is a great way to do this as uh, rather than you testing it with every single device you can find in your own house. Next, as I mentioned, I use Prolific. So I go on to do a small online sample, usually around 10 participants. So this makes sure that my links are working correctly, that it is sending them back to Prolific afterwards, that the data is being produced in a way that I intend it to be produced and that no further issues have arisen. Finally, after all of that, I go back and do a final personal check. So this is making sure that any changes I've made as a result of this pilot pipeline haven't messed up the study. They are also working in the way I intended to. And yet just one final check to make sure it's all working well. And then I send out my exper experiment to hopefully collect high quality data. So just to summarise what I've spoken about today, so piloting is always a worthwhile investment. It might take time and occasionally guerrilla tokens and prolific money, but it is always worthwhile doing it in a small sample so that you don't end up wasting a large amount of money later. It is important to pilot with both friends and family, as well as a small sample of your intended participants. Uh, so like I mentioned in my trail making, this makes sure that it is actually working for both groups of people. It's important to pilot all of your workflow as well as your data output so that you don't gather all of your data and then find out it hasn't restored everything in the way you expected it to. And then finally, make sure you use these pilot findings to go ahead and uh, inform your exclusion criteria before your study and then pre-register those exclusion criteria. So that's all I'm going to be talking about today. Thank you very much for listening. I'd just like to thank Joe and the Gorilla team, my supervisors, and of course, everyone who has ever piloted my studies for me. Thank you. All right. Fantastic talk, Emily. Thanks very much. Um, I guess uh, two things came to mind as I was, as I was listening. One is just that um, it, that is a very, very clear exposition of the many, many benefits of, of piloting your data. To what extent do you think this is like specific to online or are these kind of things equally valuable when you're when you're doing in-person face-to-face testing? I think that with online testing, it definitely highlights issues that you might not have foreseen, especially if you've started with lab-based testing and then you just think, oh, it's going to be great. I can put it online. It'll be exactly the same. And that's very rarely the case. But it is also vital for those lab based testings as you are so up close to your project, but you're also a scientist. And so the way you see your study and understand your tasks might be completely different to how someone without a scientific background sees them. Yeah. And in fact, that raises the second question that I had for you, which is you mentioned that you ask people who are essentially naive participants to, to be. Uh, do you ever ask them to sort of be meatheads with it and to sort of purposely screw things up in ways that you might not have even thought to do? So my supervisors do do that quite often um, <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that I yeah, can catch any sort of errors. Um, and quite often family members will purposefully do that without me asking. Um, where I sort of say to them afterwards, um, I think you might have some issues here. And they're like, oh, no, no, I was doing it on purpose when they haven't responded to, you know, 50% of my trials. Um, so, yeah, I don't often ask them, but it does often happen. That's great. So you've got people who are looking out for you in that sense. Yeah, Perfect. exactly. Excellent. Well, I can see that uh, Jenny's ready for hers. So I just want to say thanks again, Emily. Fantastic talk. Really, really valuable.